Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and I give them a quick flip through and review. Although that's not exactly what I'm going to be doing in this video because in this video I haven't actually read through a lot of these. These are things that just arrived and I wanted to give you guys just, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing these days, what I'm looking through these days and what's just come in the mail because a lot of this have just arrived. So I have the So You Want to Be a Game Master by Justin Alexander, literally just arrived. I have not even had a chance to, to read through this at all, but there's plenty of reviews on YouTube for this already. I don't think I'm gonna do one. It looks really cool. Uh, I got it because I saw a couple really, really, you know, positive reviews for it, and I wanted to check it out. It's like 500 pages. I mean, this book is huge, so it'll take me a while to get through it. But I like Justin Alexander. I like his stuff, so I think I'll probably like this one. So anyway, I just wanted to, you know, I have it. I haven't really <laughs> gone through it at all. Um, I have the Dungeon World book, which I do want to talk about a little bit. And then uh, A Rasp of Sand, which is a tabletop RPG zine. It is a really interesting dungeon. I haven't, or not a dungeon, it's sort of a, I mean, it is a dungeon, but it's more of like a, like a roguelike. It's a really interesting procedural generation method and sort of like a generation, sort of like that game Rogue Legacy. It's a lot like that, that video game. I haven't played it, and I haven't really read through it in detail again. It just pretty much came, but uh, I think it's interesting. The art in it is really, really kind of, I don't know, unique. And I might do a review on it at some point when I've actually read it. I can't say that I uh, have done very much here with it, with it, except kind of looked at the cover and looked it over. So this is also just kind of to show you that I got it. It's kind of an interesting thing. But I wanted to talk about these things that I have here. This is a whole stack of zines. These are the adventures by Circe Victory. Now, I've reviewed three of them before. The Shrine of the Jaguar Princess, uh, the Lost Caves of the Worm Witch, and the Tomb of the Dusk Queen. I've reviewed all three of these on my channel before in PDF form. These are the print versions. You can see there, um, well, they're each, this one's very small, just a handful of pages. These are all printed by Lulu. But there are some changes between the PDF, at least for this one, the Tomb of the Dusk Queen. There were some changes between the PDF and the print version that I immediately noticed. One is that it's for first-level dungeons instead of a third-level dungeons, and it makes a lot more sense. The, the dungeon itself is sort of an introductory dungeon. It makes sense that it's for first level, so I don't know if that was a misprint. And there are some other things that have been cleared up and made a little bit more, uh, I would say, cohesive uh, with the maybe theme of the adventure, the, the focus of the adventure. So if you get it in print, I don't know if there's a different file now that you can download, but at least the print version is different than the one I got. And I got them I mean, relatively close to the same time. So I don't know when the update occurred, and I don't really know which one's first. I would imagine this one's the updated one, because it seems like it makes more sense. Anyway, I'm not going to go through the changes in detail, because it's basically the same adventure. But the print quality is Lulu. It's what you'd expect. It's a little flip book, you know? The other ones are a little bit better. Uh, these two, which are also... These seem pretty much the same. The Shrine of the Jaguar Princess and the Lost Caves of the Worm Witch. Uh, they seem pretty much the same from the PDF, from what I could tell. And they're, they're good. These are a little bit thicker. The quality of the book cover is a little better. There are a couple more pieces of incidental art. Uh, and I would say that actually, I think one of them has an extra page um, just with uh, a few extra bits of information. But for the most part, it's the same document you're getting um, if you get the PDF. So if you do want to spring for the Lulu edition, this is what you're getting out of it, which is a, it's a little booklet, you know, it's not terribly thick. Um, but it's nice, and I'm glad that I have it. I, I, I'm more inclined to run books that I have, actually, physically. And this is the same. It's, it's, it's similarly, um, you know, small and kind of a, a bendy, flat book. The other two, the, the two that I wanted to cover, other than Dungeon World, are Plague Jewels of Sekhmet and The Caldera of the Sickle Dancer, which were two adventures that I hadn't reviewed. One is a gauntlet, it's a level zero adventure, this one. And then The Caldera of the Sickle Dancer is a... Uh, level 3 dungeon. And the these are both uh, a little bit more skinny. A little smaller, especially the, the, the gauntlet. But I wanted to cover the gauntlet in particular. This one's cool too. Essentially, um, they're both in the same vein. They're both good dungeon crawls for dun Shadow Dark. Well designed and uh, the presentation is great. But I really like this one because the, the idea behind it is really interesting. Essentially, you are... you were formerly servants of this great... Uh, you know, kind of like Egyptian-esque pharaoh who buried you all alive. And now you've awoken centuries later with not really any memory trapped in the tomb. And you have this curse, and it's, you know, rotting your flesh away. And you've got to get out and find a way to remove the curse before you uh, 
brought away. So there's the, the, the built-in timer of Shadow Dark is that actual, you have three hours to solve the problem before you uh, melt away. But it's a level zero gauntlet, and you start off in the middle of the dungeon, you're trying to get out. That's a really cool idea. It's not one that I've seen before, where you start off as like these you know, ancient, long forgotten um, servants of this queen, and you now you have to escape. It's kind of cool. It's kind of a cool idea. You could start a very interesting campaign that way. Uh, this one is also has rules for tournament scoring, if you want to play this as like a competitive game where you have two tables running it at the same time. And there's actually an opportunity for like interaction, where you like you 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 do one thing in one dungeon and it affects negatively the other the other table. It's kind of interesting. But otherwise, it's a pretty straightforward uh, adventure. Very short, little uh, little PDF or no PDF, a little short file here, short booklet here. Uh, the PDF and the files are uh, very cheap. You can get it on online. Uh, but I, I like having it in print. Again, I, I'm more inclined to run things that I have in print, even if I play online, because I like having something in front of me that I can, you know, reference rather than click through. I like to have that. So I'm, I'm more inclined to play these now that I have them. The other one here is the Caldera of the Sickle Dancer. Now, I haven't really gone through this one in as much detail. As I said, I just got these. So, But this one essentially is there's a volcano, and there's a Merolith, who is, uh, she used to be like a belly dancer or something, and now she's here. And... Uh, you're trying to get in and get out before the volcano erupts. So there's a volcano table, eruption table, and that's sort of the built-in time mechanic. That's one of the things that I think Sursa does really well in all of his dungeons, is he adds a very interesting, not all of them, I guess, but in most of them, there's an interesting element of, of the use of time. Things build up, things tick down, and then you get the, you know, the, the climax, and it's... Uh, you got to get out of there, in or out, before uh, before the end. And because that it kind of plays with the Shadow Dark live timer, um, you know, there's there's you could easily leave out that live timer in Shadow Dark games. I think a lot of people do. I often do when I'm playing. But I think it's cool to to play with it and to see if it's a part of the system. Is there a way? Are, are there ways to make it really interesting and uh, you know to, to to actually try it out and see how it works and try different variations on it and see which ones work, which ones don't work so well. Uh, it's part of the fun of trying a new system is to see, you know, try all the rules of it and see which ones work well. And I think uh, all of these, or at least all the ones with that very strong time mechanic, um, no, not this one, uh, the other, these, these ones, uh, they all do something interesting with that idea of timer. And you see this with, I think, uh, Runehammer's Adventures too, the ones that I've reviewed before. And they use that real timer mechanic in an interesting way. Does it always work out? I'm not sure. I don't think so. Not always, but sometimes it seems really cool. So uh, I, I really uh, like all of these. I wanted to go through the Dungeon World book really quickly. I know that there are plenty of reviews on this before, but it's new to me. I had, I mean, of course, I've heard about Dungeon World for a long, long time. And uh, and it's just, it's always been there. It's kind of like, oh yeah, it's another system. It's more narrative focused. I know a lot of people swear by it. A lot of people don't like it. Um, but it's been out there for quite a few years now. Um, and... I had just never given it really a look. I mean, I had played other Burning Wheel things, especially, you know, Torchbearer, and uh, I've looked into things like that. But it's just never been on top of my list to go into Dungeon World or any of the, the things associated with it. But then I started to look at some of the other products, really as I was starting to kind of get more into this channel. And I was like, well, I should probably look at some of the things out there, some of the options for things to review, things to get. And I was like, well, what about Dungeon World? And the various products that are associated with Dungeon World. And so far, I've been very impressed. Not necessarily with the system itself, although it's actually really interesting and I would like to try it out at some point. But really with the way that this book uh, changes the mindset, I guess, of, of playing games, of DMing, GMing. It really comes at things from a different perspective than a lot of games. The narrative focus, the idea that the rules are tied to the, uh, the narrative, and the narrative is tied to the rules back and forth, right? So very often, for example, like say D&D 5e, you'll have a character who is, you know, a certain type, a certain way. Narratively, storyline-wise, they're a certain, certain kind of character. And then an event will happen, say, in combat that throws it off, that completely changes the way the character has been developing. And, and you know, it'll be like, so for example, your character is, was raised as, you know, just, you know, total random, uh, 
Random example. Your character was raised in like a, you know, a spider haunted wood and he grew up hunting spiders or something like that. Okay, great. And then uh, say there's a, a, a spider sorceress who casts the fear spell and it manifests a bunch of spiders coming out and your that particular character fails it, right? So now he's afraid of spiders specifically, or he, he, he has that fear condition as a result of seeing spiders. Well, in D&D 5e, that's it. You're just like, okay, you take the fear condition and you're done. In, in Dungeon World, the idea is like, well, no, okay, hold on. Would that guy actually be afraid of spiders? Like, no. All right, cool. Then he's not affected by that effect. So, I mean, you could also say, well, yes, he should be affected by it because actually in his backstory, his mentor was devoured by this kind of spider and that's what the... the, the whatever you want to say. My point here is, is not to be <laughs> too specific there. Um, but rather that the narrative focus of Dungeon World means that the mechanics rise, uh, mechanics give rise to narrative. So if you use a mechanical flourish, a move, and it has a mechanical benefit, you now have to adapt the narrative to fit that. And it needs to, and you're, and you're trying to make it cohesive. So it's not just, oh yeah, my character is like this, but now I have the fear effect. Okay, I guess I'll wait for a round or two until that condition wears off. And it doesn't affect my character really after that moment. That's not going to happen in Dungeon World. Or at least not again as written the intention and and that's why you know i i'm not so much interested in the mechanics of the game but in the way that it thinks about things there's a lot of very interesting ideas in the background of dungeon world that i really really appreciate uh, a lot of them the actual execution of it i'm not so sure the art isn't my favorite uh, there's a lot of just text and text and text and text and a lot of these pages now it's well written the, 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 the actual descriptions of things are well written. The examples given are all very clear. Uh, and I like that it's much more of a discussion between the players and the DM. That the, the DM, the GM, has moved that they are to do specific rules uh, of how they are to affect the story, and the players are to do that as well. For example, the bard. The bard has an ability that I think is called, like, speak frankly or something. And the bard class can just say to any character's, uh, any character's player, the, you as a player say to the other player, hey, what is motivating your character? There's like a list of like five things you can choose from. What's actually motivating your character? What's something I can do for you? Like just a, a set of uh, options. And the other player, DM or, or other player at the table, has to just be honest and open with you. They have to just say it. And then in return, they can ask you this one of those same five questions. So if the DM wants to know more about you as a player, your motivation, or your character's motivation, um, you can just go into it. Right? Charming and open, that's just the idea here. Uh, when you speak frankly with someone, you can ask their player a question from the list below. They must answer it truthfully. Then they may ask you a question from the list, which you must, which you must answer truthfully. And then these list of questions. So instead of, you know, instead of just like the DM having all power and being able to say, oh, no, that doesn't happen, or this doesn't happen, or I'm going to, you know, what's actually going on here? You make it a, um, a more collaborative effort. And that works with like, the world building side of things and it works with the, the actual way the mechanics work. You ask players, okay, which mechanic are you using? Did you mean to use this mechanic or did you want to use that mechanic? And the player's like, oh yeah, that's what I wanted to do. And then the GM will be like, okay, here are triggers. And the examples say like, well, no, you know, GM, that's not what I'm doing here. I'm doing this. And the GM goes, oh yeah, you're right. Uh, I, I, that, that's, you're more accurate there. So the players and the GM basically have the same tool set, or sort of a, a, at least a shared uh, set of tools. Some of them are shared. And they are to kind of work together on the narrative that comes out of the game. So it's just a different focus than D&D 5e or Shadow Dark or any of the other games I've been playing, which is much more, I would say, gamey. Even, and it's different kinds of gamey, right? Different systems for how to run this or that. And there's not to say there aren't systems in this game. And I haven't finished the book yet, I have to admit, I'm only about halfway through. But just the way that the, the writers approach, um, approach the topics, it's worth reading just as kind of like a, I don't know, it's, it's a different perspective on gaming, a different perspective on role-playing games. Not to say that it's entirely opposed or anything like that, it's just, it's a different focus. It's a, it's a shifted perspective. You know, we're looking at the same... This is looking at the same statue as 5e is looking at, say. But 5e is looking at it from this perspective, and this book is looking at it from that perspective. So it's the same thing, but you're going to see different, different aspects of the game that we're looking at from that perspective. So I, I, I think Dungeon World is a great book. I'd highly recommend anybody who 
is more interested in sort of the theory behind gaming and are interested in approaching games from different perspectives. Just to give it a read. You know, even if you're not going to use the Dungeon World game, which I'm probably not going to use it certainly as my main game, I might try uh, an adventure or two with this system, but I don't think I'm going to make it my, my go-to. But just the way that it approaches gaming, I, I was reading through it and I was like, that, that's really cool. That changes the way I think about this sort of scene, or that changes the way I sort of think about that interaction. So like, for example, I'll give you another example. One of the, one of the effects uh, of the player casting a spell, if they fail, they can choose to put themselves into a difficult position. That's sort of one of the choices. So you fail it, if you succeed it perfectly, if you roll 10 or higher on 2d6, then you've just succeeded perfectly, you're great, you're good. If you fail, or if you succeed by like, you know, nine to seven or something like that, then you succeed, but you have to choose. Do I uh, lose the spell forever, or for the day, I should say? Do I have an unintended consequences? Do I put myself in danger? So the player gets to choose how the narrative proceeds, and the, the, the player can choose. I would like to put myself in danger. Now the GM has to respond to that. Okay, well, what in this situation would put you into danger? Well, that means the goblins get to you, right? They turn their focus on you, or the ground beneath your feet then collapses, or right. So the the dice aren't telling you necessarily something that your character would know. They're talking, and it's not necessarily do I succeed or fail. The dice are the dice are there as a narrative tool, so that you and the player together, you and the players together, everybody at the table can kind of collaborate on telling this story as it moves on. So in that example that they give where the player chooses something dangerous, uh, you, the GM, can say, yeah, the ground collapses beneath your feet or the goblins attack. Or because you know that two floors down in the dungeon there's a demon, maybe the demon now knows that they're here because the magic awakens it or something like that. Right? So you as the GM use your knowledge of the world beyond what the players know to respond in more narratively significant ways than the players would based on just what they know in that scene. That's one of the major differences between you and them is that you've done your prep, and so you know more than they do about the world, and therefore you know more about the consequences that you can bring to bear for their actions and their choices. That's a really cool way of thinking about it, and it's just not one way that I'd ever thought about it before. So anyway, I, you know, maybe that's obvious to a lot of people, and especially I think if you've read Dungeon World, that's obvious to you, but that's cool. And it just, again, it's something that's worth thinking about in the way that you're designing games. If you're a game designer, if you're thinking about playing games as a GM, it changes your perspective on the collaboration here. Now, some people don't really want to do that collaborative game. They want to do a much more of the DM creates the world, and then the players use the mechanics of the game to try to interact with it, and you know they, they keep that going. And the narrative is sort of what arises out of the dice rolls telling us if you've succeeded or failed at these various tasks. And that's pretty much it. Uh, I think it's a slightly different way of looking at it. So anyway, I recommend checking out Dungeon World if you guys ever get a chance to, because it, again, just if you want to, if you want to just read through the uh, the mechanics there, and and maybe adapt some of them, that's fine. But the ideas behind it, the sort of philosophy behind it, is what I think makes it so interesting. And then I'd recommend these books, maybe not in print exactly. I mean, Lulu was a nightmare. I have to say, they lost my shipment the first time, and the second time they took forever to print it. Just so Lulu, yeah, is not my favorite printing company, but the products themselves, once they arrived, were good, and, and I like the, uh, or the quality is good, and I and I and I like the adventures, I like Sirs of Victory's adventures, and then these two again, I, I have to go through in more detail. Rasp of Sand seems interesting, um, it's kind of an interesting take on the the dungeon, the idea that's kind of procedurally generated, and it has this sort of recurrent, you come back again and again with new characters after each attempt, each delve, it's sort of like again Rogue Legacy or any of those roguelike games. And then I do really want to read this, but it's going to take me a while. 500 pages, you know, <laughs> that's, to do a full review of this of this book would take me too long. So I'm just going to, uh, you know, maybe recommend that you guys watch some of the v reviews on it. Uh, and then if in the future I do manage to get through it in a reasonable amount of time, I might give you my, my thoughts on it. But that would be for <laughs> in a much, much future video. All right, guys. Anyway, I hope this has been interesting. Very, I know it's a different kind of video than I usually do because it's just more of a ramble and a haul, but yeah, that's what it is. I'll see you guys around.